It is the word that saves and heals. It is the blueprint to my destiny. Today, I stand here in agreement with the truth that sanctifies because of the blood of Jesus the Christ. It is the unchangeable, the unshakable, the unstoppable word of grace. The word that redeems and releases miracles. I'm not just a hearer, but I am a doer. I take action. I will apply this word and I will, I will, I will manifest in Jesus name. Come on, shake, put your hands together and shout amen. Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 through 4 and Acts chapter 27 verses 23 and 24. Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 and 4, 1 through 4 and Acts chapter 27 verses 23 through 24. We want to keep Roland Boyd and his family in prayer, his father passed a couple of days ago and so we want to just keep that family in prayer amen we want to keep um, Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in prayer Pastor Bird passed and went on to be with the Lord and we had his home going service on Friday and um, so we just want to be mindful of the people who are dealing with loss and separation right now amen and, uh, we are excited I'm going to have times when I'm super excited and I slow all the way down. So it's a jet lag Sunday. Look at your neighbor and say jet lag Sunday. Amen. But it's all right. God is good. I believe that God has given me a word this morning. It is intentional. It's intentional to encourage some people. It's intentional to stir up some folk. And I believe it's intentional even as God had done for me. Uh, some people who aren't careful might get a little offended. They may find themselves in the midst of a statement that pertains to them and, and might feel like uh, someone is pointing them out. But I promise you, it's not me. It's the Holy Ghost. Um, I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning. God said, just say this. And so um, we, we did what the Lord told us to do. We were going in another direction. And so we did what the Lord said. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord <laughs> and he said prophesy to them and say O ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord Acts chapter 27 verses 23 through 24 says for there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve saying fear not Paul thou must be brought before Caesar and lo God hath given thee all them that sail with thee and God hath given thee all them that sail with me saying fear not Mark thou must be brought before kings and lo God hath given thee all them that sail with thee saying fear not Potter's house Dayton thou must be brought before giants and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Father, we thank you. We honor you for this moment, for this time. 
Speak to us now, clear, concise, with authority, with the anointing that can only come from heaven. As I borrow it, God, let me borrow it yet again today that I might be poured out of, that the people might hear you, that something might take place, that you might awaken, stir, move, remove, replenish, restore, or whatever it is you need to do in us so that you can do what you desi desire to do through us. We love and honor you, sir. Help my tongue to be like the pen of a ready writer. Help me to say it the way you want it said. Use me, but for your glory. We love and we honor you, sir, more than life itself. We love your word more than our very breath. We need you now, but we thank you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Tap three people and tell them your next destination depends on your determination. Your next destination depends on your determination. Sometimes it's all about what we really want to accomplish in life, what we really want to see God do will determine where we end up. There is a plan, but you've got to participate. There is something that God has said that he's going to do, but you've got to cooperate. And a lot of times it's the way you think about a thing will determine how you deal with the stuff that comes up in the meantime. I believe that as I am, many of you are amazed that we're already about halfway through the year. That uh, it's moving fast. And I believe, being a basketball person and watching the playoffs, that many times it's how you end the first half will really set precedence of how you begin the second half. And so I believe that it's timely in the month of June that we talk about ending this first half right with an expectation of the months to come. There's no question that time is flying. And I believe more than ever that it's imperative that we don't waste time. I believe it's crucial how we govern our affairs and activities, uh, both in and out of church, all of them in the spirit that we don't allow ourselves in this particular season to become uh, neither lethargic or apathetic. Uh, in other words, neither lazy or unresponsive as it relates to the word of God. I heard my father even say that if you're going to kill time, then you ought to work it to death. Uh, that time shouldn't just go by. That time is given to us in windows of opportunity and we've got to do what we can to take advantage of all those opportunities. How many of you know that in spite of uh, where you are now, that God has some great things planned for your life? I don't, I don't know if anybody's in here now that's in their greatness already, but I know that even in my suffering, there's still some more great to come out. I don't know. Some of you may already be flowing in your greatness, and for you, God bless you. But I believe that God has some other things planned for our lives. That even though uh, it's not quite as pretty as we would like it to be now, that we can remember that God is at work. Uh, I want to quickly prophesy and tell somebody something great is closer than you think. Uh, the, enemy, the enemy wouldn't be at you the way that he is if something wasn't just around the corner. Slap somebody and say, it's around the corner. It's around... It's around the corner. And I, I believe that you're, you're, you, you're in a fight because there's something that the enemy is trying to keep away from you or keep you away from. I said this for years. It's amazing to me that the enemy is more confident in the fact that God desires to bless you than we are sometimes. 
And so because we haven't come to grips of how much God loves us and what God desires to do for us, that we become lazy when it relates to positioning ourselves for what God wants to do with us. And so because the enemy has gotten a glimpse of that, he's turned up the volume. He's pumped up the volume or he's turned up the heat on what he's trying to do against us because he knows if whatever God has determined ever takes place or we ever lay hold on it, we're going to be too much for him to handle. And so I believe that's why the enemy is releasing so much hell and turmoil and chaos, confusion and struggle is because he recognizes that there's something particularly important about who you are. Ah, that there's something significant about your life. You're not just here by happenstance. You are here for a particular reason. You didn't get out of your last situation just to say that you got out, but you got out because God still got something that he wants you to do. Because if you be honest, there's some stuff you should have went down in. Ah, there's some stuff that should have been exposed about you that when everybody found out, they walk away from your life. But God has allowed you to stay in the cusp of his hand because he still has a plan for us. I don't know about you, but there's some hell that's still in our lives that it's time for it to get out. It's time for some of the hell that's been plaguing us. It's time for it to go. God is saying that he wants us to get rid of some of the confusion and disarray and distractions that have been overwhelming our lives. Slap three people and tell them it's time to get the hell out of my life. It's time to get the hell out of my life. It's time that some of the stuff that's been burdening me begins to get removed and I don't have to deal with this craziness no more. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of cycles of disappointment every time I think I'm going up it looks like I'm going down every time I'm going forward it looks like they're pushing me back and it doesn't even matter. It might be you, them, or some of those but I'm sick of folk who can can't see that God wants to still do something with my life. I got to get some of the hell out of my life. Oh, I know it ain't been pretty for you, but God still, somebody say he's still, he's still. God still has something in store for you. You got to make sure that you ain't linked up to too many folk that's refusing to make the changes that's going to help you get to where you got to go. If folk don't want to change, ah, uh, uh, move. Uh, get out the way. I've got somewhere. I've got to go. And if you've been like that and I've been right here and you're not going to change, I got to do something. Ah, uh, slap somebody and say, I got to do something. I got to do something because I realize the way I am I'm not going to manifest <laughs> so I've got to change but if you ain't changing with me uh, I know you my brother I know you my sister I know you my friend I know we've been down like four flat tires but if you're not going to change you're going to mess me up uh, what I realized when I went out of the country is that there's some places you can't take some folk so we're going to have to evaluate relationships, people we've been down with. Ah, tell somebody we've been down long enough. We've been down. I'm ready to be with some people I can be up with. And see, we've got to realize that there's some people in our lives that really don't want to go nowhere else. And I've come to the place where that's okay. You don't have to want to go nowhere else, but in order for me to do what God wants me to do, I'm going to have to leave you right there. And if you like it, I love it. I ain't talking about you. I'm talking about me. It's time for us to get focused on the things of God and His will. No longer appropriate to try to do things our way than expect God's hand to be evident in our endeavors. We can't just keep looking at things from a myopic standpoint and saying, I won't and I'm going to do. And God's not in it. And then expect God to bless it. This is my life. No, it's not. 
Your life been bought with a price. You gave that thing up a long time ago when you asked Jesus to help you. If it was your life, you shouldn't have asked for no help. If you was in trouble, you should have got your own raggedy tail out of that situation. But because you called on God, you forfeited. All right. As owner and CEO of your life, I believe that God is saying that he's ready to move for people who will trust him like never before. He's looking for people, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to say it until December, so if you don't want to hear it again, it'd be a good time to change churches. That he's looking for people who are properly aligned and submitted to the ways of the kingdom. It doesn't even mean that you're perfect or even what you're submitted to and properly aligned with as it relates to pastors and churches and, and the kingdom agenda other than the kingdom agenda is perfect in and of itself. But people are looking, God's looking for people who are properly aligned. Uh, folk who, uh, uh, who understand and respect the word of God on Wednesday and Thursday the way they do on Sunday. Uh, they don't show up to church just so they can do something, but they're showing up to church so they can be something. Uh, people who uh, in this year, 2012, understand that it's about order and being governed by the word of God. And that we've got to bring, and even though I know for some of us, I know there's areas in my life that I keep taking back from God. But the whole purpose is that all of our life, our whole life, be under the governance of God. That there's no part of us that God doesn't have the last say in. And even if you're wrong, you're willing to say you're wrong and don't try to fix it like God don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. Because then that causes us to be honest with ourselves. That causes us, see, you can't put on a facade with God. Your public holiness and your private holiness eventually supposed to match. So even though you acting like you are right, even though you acting like it's okay, you've got to get right with God when it ain't nobody but him and you in the room. You can't act like you got it all together, but you can't love nobody. You can't act like because you ain't drinking no more, but you judging other folks. You got to get the whole spectrum of your relationship right with God. Just because we don't see who you went last night don't mean you wasn't with somebody last night. God is saying he wants all of it. To come under his control. And where we need help, we ask for help. I don't know about you, but my natural father used to always say, before you tear something up, ask somebody to help you. <laughs> Uh, that's the problem with most Christians and people who have experienced some levels of deliverance. Now you act like you're too good to ask for help. You still broke. You still ain't got no job. Your wife and your husband ain't talking to you. Your kids can't stand you. Don't nothing work. You ain't got nowhere to stay. Tell somebody I need some help. Yeah, it, it, ain't, it ain't okay if it ain't okay. It's funny how we'll get sick and go to the doctor. I heard Ron got sick. They said he went to the hospital. I hung the phone up. I said, yeah, he, he tough, but he wasn't that tough. What's my point? When our body breaks down, we seek help. We recognize the symptoms when something ain't right. See, the problem is too many folk in the sanctuary sniffing in the spirit, but you think you ain't got no cold. <laughs> And by the time you address it, you're going to have spiritual pneumonia. And then we're going to be trying to resuscitate you. And the same folk that you wanted to act like you was all that in front of, going to have to be the same folk pumping on you talking about clear. Yes, so when your nose start dripping, look at your neighbor and say, ask for a tissue, ask for a tissue. I'm out of order. Something ain't right. My body, my spirit is telling me that I need some help. So God is just saying, I just want some folk who are serious about wanting to serve me and don't want to try to do things their own way. Uh, God is looking for people who uh, want to uh, remember that it's not about how much of your life you control, but about how much of your life is under control. And when I talk about control, I'm talking about the auspices of the word. 
I'm talking about the auspices of the spirit and the auspices of the house of God. Everybody said amen when I said the word. By the time I got to the house of God, did nobody say nothing. And that's the problem with the church, the house of God. Most folk would like to think that the house of God should have no jurisdiction in their lives. And that once they leave church service or once they leave preaching, who gives a flip what the house of God thinks? But see, I want to tell those ignorant people that you can't separate the house of God from God. Huh? There's no way you can serve God and don't serve the house of God. There's no way you can love God and not love the house of God. Huh? In other words, you wouldn't be invited to eat in my house because you love me, but you don't like my children. I, I, don't, I don't understand how people think that God is governing you and not governing his body. See, because the house of God is where God has set it up and made it and determined that it's the place where he's going to allow the grace to flow to equip, empower, and enhance the lives of his children. So you can't be connected to God and disconnected from the house of God for too long. And I know a bunch of y'all don't want to hear that because you like to live your life vicariously through how you interpret the Bible. But the problem is if your interpretation is wrong, then you're going to have the wrong direction and you're going to end up in a dead end and miss all the detour signs and then you're going to be the one hating on the folk in church when you begin to see their lives manifest. I see it time and time again. Where folk think they got all the answers. Realize they were the answers to the wrong questions. House of God is where God is saying, I'm going to develop your understanding of my plan. Not just for you, but how you fit into my ultimate plan for the church. It's where the joints are fitly joined together. It's where we sharpen one another. It's where we have help when we're down. I'm amazed at the emails that I got even while I was gone, the people that were in trouble and that were tired of spiraling down. Some of the emails didn't even come from those individuals, but it came from people who loved them because they, re they recognized that these people were going in the wrong direction. Here it is, you disconnected from church, but when you got in trouble, you called the church. You needed prayer, emergency rescue, and of course, money. And it's amazing that some people will automatically gravitate to folk who are prospering going to church while they're not going to church to get from them what they're getting from church. But because they don't have it because they're not going to church, they connect with somebody who is going and getting it. And all they got to do is go for themselves. I was always taught the quickest place between two points. It's a straight line. So I'm going to keep it straight today. We've got a problem. Not just in the body, but at the potter's house. That we've got too many people that want to say they belong, but then don't want to belong. We've got too many people that want the benefits, but they don't ever want to sweat. we got people who want the title, but don't want the towel. we got folk that's running around talking about what God is doing, but they ain't even heard what God is saying. And the proof comes by their connectivity. Slap three people and say, if I'm connected to too much foolishness. You know, because foolishness don't like order. So if you got a lot of foolishness around you, don't check them. <laughs> if it's easy for folk that don't engage in the kingdom to be around me and never get uncomfortable then there's something wrong with my connection to the kingdom church is where the word flows that strengthens us prepares us and even awakens us to the kingdom agenda for our corporate and individual lives it's where clarity comes as it relates Mo to assignment anointing and assets uh, this trichotomic jurisdiction, the word, the spirit, and the house of God, is where we are governed, somebody say worship. It's the place of conception and inspiration of the will of God. It's where God continues to breathe in us 
as it relates to his intention for our lives. It is where God is able to speak to us about who we are, why we're here, and what we are supposed to be doing. This jurisdiction frames our heart, minds, and soul for the epic battles that await us and try to allure us away from the path and the trek that has been both chosen and paid for us. It's, watch this, it's what instructs and trains us for warfare. See, and not only the external forces of the enemy and the onslaught of his treachery, but also the tyranny and terrorism that, that we bring on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, remember, God is working for us so that he can work through us, but he always has to be working in us. I tell somebody, I ain't going to act like this forever. I ain't going to act like this forever. Say forever, forever. I ain't going to act like this forever. Uh, if you use ain't, you can't say ver. You got to say va. I ain't going to act like this forever. And we learned over the last few weeks that, and we're taught that uh, to be thankful, not only as we worship and go to war, but as we wait. Uh, because in the midst of some of our situations, sometimes it gets hard to stay cheerful. And while our circumstances are still jacked up, it's hard to be thankful. And I know some of us have been smiling but crying on the inside, trying to stay positive but surrounded by negativity. You ever had one of those days where it's negative at the house, negative on the job, might even be negative at church. Your whole day was full of negativity, but some kind of way you've been trying to keep your smile on. That's why the Bible tells us, and while we kept it up for years, that it said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When stuff and things try to weigh you down, look at your neighbor and say so. Yeah. While you got dilemmas and situations, say so. That's why he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Uh, because I believe that even in the midst of what I'm going through, I can tell the enemy so. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to bless God. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. I'm not going to be moved by the maneuvers of the enemy. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 in the New Living Translation says, In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, somebody say wow. And I believe that while we wait and while we're suffering and while we're being patient and while we're being persecuted and while we're experiencing all the hell that we're experiencing, we might as well give him some praise. Uh, because after a while, something is going to change. I dare about 150 people to just start giving God some praise. And you know you got some hell on your hands. You're waiting for God to do something. You need something to flip. You need something to turn. You ought to be intentional about about giving God some praise. Don't patty cake God. I'm talking about dancing in your dilemmas, weeping at your worries, clapping in the midst of your calamity, telling the devil, so what? I believe because after a while, God's going to do something that's going to shift your entire life. He's going to bring into your life, into your existence, what you need. For him to do what he has already been working that you haven't been recognizing. Because ultimately, God wants to use you as his witness, his example, representative in the earth. Remember, as Jesus was the master, uh, we must prove to be his disciples. See, because if he had to go through, we're going to have to go through. But just like he got victory, we're going to get victory. See, be, we, we have to be conformed to God's image. Uh, we have to understand that it's crucial not just to, just to believe him, but to know him. See, see, the truth of it is, we got a lot of people who come to church that don't know Jesus. And just because you ain't doing something no more don't mean you know Jesus. Because I can go down the street to the mosque and grab about 25 Muslims who got lives cleaner than yours will ever be. They don't do nothing. They look straight ahead. It ain't no foulness in their life, but they don't know Jesus. See, because you don't get to heaven by what you don't do. You get to heaven by who you know. 
Some people wouldn't know Jesus if he came right back, right now. So the Bible is teaching us that we've got to know him. We've got to receive him. We've got to receive his spirit because to as many as received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God. Remember, Jesus is the perfect model. He has the body of Christ model for us, devotion to the will of God, and he had supreme dedication to kingdom purpose, principles, power, provision, and perseverance. So now we as the body of Christ must follow that lead and be governed likewise. We have to become determined to do likewise because first the pattern, then the glory. That's why the body of Christ is, or God is calling the body of Christ both individually and corporately to proper governance and alignment and somebody shout order. See, with no eventual order, there will be no sustaining manifestation. That's why God is calling his body to unity. Unity is where he commands the blessing. It's called uh, an ecclesiastical order. See, because the blessing flows from the head down. And I know some folk don't want to get with that, and some people believe that I don't need to have a head. I'm just going to get my blessings because what God has for me is for me. But see, don't take the song and twist it because they got good theology. They just used a portion of it to try to give God some praise. They didn't try to give you no new doctrine. Because if you don't have a head, then your body going to die. Okay. So unity, God is calling for ecclesiastical order so he can command the blessing. He's also calling for structure. This is where you get produced. This is where you get nipped. This is where you get corrected. This is where John says you must be pruned. So whatever you've been doing, it can become more excellent. The problem with most of us is that we don't like structure because structure forces us to make changes. See, structure indirectly says the way you've been and the way you've been doing it has now become inadequate. And so some of us don't like to be told that we've become inadequate. God is looking for character. This is the power of God is, is emanated through our character. It's called moral order. And then God is looking for stewardship. First Peter 4 and 10 told us that uh, there's a grace that's flowing, but we've got to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So there's a flow of grace, and this is called dutiful order. This is where God is looking for order both ecclesiastically, correctively, morally, and dutifully. So we've been spending some time, Potter's House, talking about stewardship. Now, I'm going to reflect real quick. It started because God had birthed something, or it was actually birthed because there was need for a better understanding of our need to participate and cooperate with God as it related to giving. Amen. Somebody Amen. say giving. Amen. Lord, have mercy. I wish I was back in Africa. It not only is our gift, grace, and anointing, but it's also an element of our worshipful lifestyle. To give to the kingdom agenda. Well, y'all shouted on breakthrough. Tithes and offering and seeds and gifts and blessings. The Bible teaches us that we ought to be excited and anticipate the opportunity to join with God in the work of the kingdom. But see, this is why many of us are still dejected. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And God has lost your heart because he don't have your treasure. It was an indictment last week. I ain't had a job in three years. And I've given more in one service myself from stuff that's happened for me than the entire congregation gave in one service. See, sometimes we need to face our situations because I think some of you think everything's already taken care of in the natural but you gotta participate if you own a business you want folk to pay full price if you go to your job and you put in your time you want your boss to give you a full check 
If you come and get up on a Sunday morning, you want this Negro in the pulpit to have a full word. But you don't want to fully participate. Watch, watch this. Not for somebody individually can advance, but for the work of the kingdom. And then we become lazy because we depend on a few people to carry the whole load. But stewardship just don't talk about money. Because I know y'all might not ever come back if we just talk about money. And I know it's my job to try to keep some of you sitting still long enough that God can say something to you. It's like when you go fishing, Pastor. You, you, you catch a certain type of fish, and, and my bishop teaches us, you just got to hold on to the line till the fish get tired. If you try to snatch it, you break the line, and the fish gone anyway. So you just hold on to it. Amen. You slap three people and say, we holding on. We holding on. It's just... So a few of them going to keep trying to run. They're going to keep wiggling. But we're going to hold on till they get tired. Finally. And that's the problem with the African-American church. Is that we don't ever want to fully submit to God till we completely broke and dejected. And now you almost can't help the work of the kingdom. <laughs> and so we got a church full of committed broke feet people. But while God is moving and doing things in your life, we act like we don't need God. Yeah. But like I said, I'm sorry. Stewardship is extended. You might have to come on Wednesday when I'm talking about something else. But stewardship, oh, I'm not even preaching Wednesday. Let the Lord use it. The stewardship is extended to other areas of grace as well as the teaching of giving. But it doesn't leave giving out. Here's an example of Jesus teaching Matthew 23, 23. Look, look at what Jesus said. We, we, we ain't going to be too much longer. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, talking about discernment and helping people, mercy and faith. These ought you to have done. Watch this, though. And not to leave the other. What? undone. So when Jesus was even talking to them about tithing and about what they did in front of the people but helping them to understand that there's some other areas of grace that they need to operate in. He was saying don't forget what's weightier but don't do, don't forget to do the other part as well. So as we talk about stewardship as it relates to other areas of grace, I don't want you to forget the grace of giving uh, in the meantime. So as we've investigated the instruction of stewardship, we found that there were seven keys to strengthen this expectation. We said they were decision, faith, performance, discipline, patience, and now we're dealing with the sixth key element, and it's determination. Uh, God is saying to us that it's time for us to become determined that we want to serve God. The dictionary defines this word and its derivatives as the power and tendency to fix, settle, and regard that the using of applied principles will provide a conclusive destination. I'm going to say that again. The power and tendency to fix, settle, and regard that the using of applied principles will provide a conclusive destination. Miriam Webster uses one of her definitions to explain determination by this. The fixation of destiny of undifferentiated embryonic tissue. The determination is, is, is described as the fixation of the destiny of undifferentiated em embryonic tissue. In other words, whatever started, regardless of the variables and the derivatives, it's going to have a conclusive destination because God said so. Whatever was birthed in you, whatever God said about you, when it was in his embryonic stage, when God first married you to your destiny, it does not matter what comes up in between. Whatever he said about you, it has to come to pass. He that has begun a good work in you shall complete it to the end. 
God won't allow what's happened to you to change what He said about you. Your destination needs your determination. It's a fixation on destiny. If you're going to get what God has, you've got to be fixated. If you want to know what happened to me in Africa, I became addicted to my destiny. If you want to know what took place and transpired, I, I took a drink of God's thoughts about me and it got me intoxicated and I want to feel like that for the rest of my life. I got addicted to the embryonic tissue of my destiny and now I'm more determined than I've ever been. Slap somebody and say he don't give a flip. Huh? I don't care who stay. I don't care who go. I don't care who want it. I don't care who don't want it. I have fixed my eyes on what God said about me. And I'm going giving hell or high water. I told Brown, whoever don't like me, this is a good chance to leave. Because in a minute I'm going to ask you to. Because I've become addicted to what God said. I've shed it false humility of not trying to act like that ain't what he said. I may not be qualified, but that's what he said. <laughs> I might have made a lot of mistakes, but that's what he said. I mean, it might not look like I'm headed in that direction, but that's what he said. Some of the people that started might not ever be with me again, but that's what he said. I might not have what it's going to take to get to where I'm going, but somebody say, that's what he said. So determination is the key to fulfilling what God has intended for our lives. But in order to prove determination, there's a few things we got to keep in mind. And the first one is, we must hear the word of the Lord. See, the problem with us is that we're not hearing the word of the Lord. And for the sake of time, when we read Ezekiel 37, 1 through 4, that even though there was great potential, and even a prophetic word concerning the bones, that in order for anything to manifest, the bones had to hear the word of the Lord. So you can be filled with all the prophecy you want to. Everybody and their mama can lay hands on you. And you can have all the potential in the world. But if you don't hear the word of the Lord, nothing is going to manifest. So you can quit going from place to place and conference to conference and book to book and get yourself settled down and hear Amos told us there was going to be a famine and we're seeing it today. Our society is plagued with pluralism relativism secular humanism where man has drawn away from objective truth see this don't care nothing about your circumstances it's the truth it doesn't care about your dilemma it's the truth it doesn't care about how hard it's getting it's the truth it doesn't care about what you don't like and what you don't want it's the truth and we've drawn away from objective truth. And we become self-governed and self-corrected. Every person that don't need the word of God, the voice of the Lord, have become islands to themselves. We've become a people that's become dependent on the ignorance of karma, mystical and transcendental meditation. And where horoscopes are still ruling your day and giving you your expectation. 
You want to know what your day going to be like? So you flick to this chick named Ann Landers who don't even know what her day going to be like so she can tell you by base where the stars are what you getting ready to get out of your day. Well, I can tell you what your day ought to be like. This is the day that the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever the devil brings, I got something to bring to him. And it's my praise. It's my thanksgiving. And it's the fact that Jesus died for me he got up for me and if he got up tell somebody I'm going up trusting in people that don't even believe themselves we have to get back to hearing the word of the Lord what does God say about the matter where is the kabod and the doxa of God as it relates to my situation? How will God get the glory of what I'm going through? What does the word say? And we got to be careful as we mature in God that we don't try to start thinking for God. I went to do something on Thursday night while I was in Africa because I was mature. And God said, son, don't think for me. Your maturity is to hear me swiftly, not to not ask me. And some of us think because we've matured a little bit that we no longer have to consult with God. That's why David said, keep me from my presumptuous sins. When I think I don't need you is the time I really do. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. Jesus with a couple of disciples, the Bible says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into the high mountain apart. You know, you always think you're special when you get to go into certain rooms with folk. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to talk to me in here. <laughs> you, you think you've arrived when certain people call you toward the front. So the Bible says, And, and was transfigured before them just when you think you know God he'll disfigure what you had in your mind <laughs> just when you think you've got God figured out tell somebody he'll transfigure it you can't figure God out you just ought to figure that you need God in your life and so God knew that they had thought that they had figured him out because he had talked to them in secret. He had said things to them that he had not said to other disciples. So they thought they had him figured out. And so God took Jesus into a high mountain and transfigured himself. And then we know the story. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, they even got to see Moses and Elijah talking with him. He don't went from the flesh to the spirit. And see, you got fools who have jacked up doctrine to say, Jesus talked to the dead. He don't talk to the dead. He just talked to dead things. He, he, he don't have conversations with the dead. He just brings to life things that have died. Now, see, remember, because Elijah got caught up. And so some theologians believe it's Moses and Elijah that have to come back in Revelation chapter 11 as the two olive trees that have to die in the street because you can't, you can't live and see God. Others argue that it might be Enoch because the Bible says that he walked with God and that he was not. But in ever, whatever the situation is and however it ends up being panned out, here it is, God has transfigured Jesus and he's on this mountain and he's got this conversation going. And then all of a sudden, Peter opened his mouth. 
the danger of mature people always got something to say when they need to just hold up and find out what's there to be seen. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, I'm only going to need verse 5. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased. And here's the point. Hear ye him. God keeps saying to us that in order for us to manifest, we're going to have to hear the word of the Lord. Somebody shout determination. I'm almost out of here. So then we, we recognize that in this story with the Apostle Paul that he's in a situation. God has already spoken to the Apostle that he would come before Caesar. So Paul was with a group of, group of people as a prisoner that was going to go through Italy. And this prisoner was put in a ship. Chapter 27 verse 1 tells us that Paul was, or this ship was determined. And when it was determined, uh, this word in the Greek means to be decreed or ordained. I need you to know that sometimes God assigns you to a ship. It hasn't been by choice, but it's been decreed and ordained. There's some stuff about your life. You can't change it if you want it to. And the Bible tells us that the winds were contrary from the beginning. That's why we can't start tripping when things and people are not flowing in the direction that you would have expected them to flow. Uh, I need you to know that when you start on this journey in what God has truly ordained for your life, everybody's not going to be there when you look up. You don't believe me? Ask Gideon. The Bible says he started with 32,000 men. And then God said, how many people you got with you? And he said, I got 32,000 and we in trouble. God said, no, that's too many. Isn't it funny that when you think you don't have enough, God says you got too much. I need to reduce what you're working with so that I can truly get the glory. What you think is an, is an underflow, God said that's an overflow. And I'm getting ready to prove who I am. So God spoke to Gideon's truth and said, everybody that's scared, I need you to go. I need y'all to know that on one Sunday morning, when Gideon gave his vision, 22,000 people left the church. I don't know about you, but I ain't never had 22,000. So I can't worry about losing 22,000. But if Gideon can lose 22,000, uh, a few hundred here and there, uh, ain't going to make me a bit of difference. Uh, if he can do what, he, what God called him to do, minus 22,000, then it's obvious. That God's going to get the glory. You're going to give me a little volume. I'm struggling. So the Bible says that he asked them to leave. If you don't believe them, God told me to ask Celebration Church. He told me to look at Tom and Bonnie Duchel. They're in the poorest continent on the face of the earth. In the poorest country on that continent, Zimbabwe. See, Gideon was a part of the poorest people in the world. <coughs> His family was the poorest of all Israel, and he was the least of his family. I just tried to help somebody. <laughs> when you look at your family, you're the worst one. <laughs> You the one ain't got no husband. You the one ain't got no job. You the one ain't got no diploma. You the one been hooked on crack. You the one been an alcoholic. You the one been the hole. You the one been the jail. You the one that's the least in the family. Somebody say, but God. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna help me. He made sure that he got Gideon from the gutter. Can I get all my gutter people to give God some praise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Use a gutter rat. Use a gutter Christian. You got a gutter anointing. You been gutter called. Hallelujah.
Sit down. We're going to stand up one more time. We'll just have a seat. But God took this church, Celebration Church, filled them with about 7,000 people, built a $28 million facility, cash money, in the midst of a recession. The people came and gave and worked. And now they lead praise and worship. They are the ones that lead the Bible college. They are the ones that opened up an orphanage. They are the ones that have opened up a clinic for cancer and HIV children. They are the ones going around Africa giving hope to the hopeless. I'm talking about the least of them. But when you get in your ordination with God, when you get in that God-called place, there's going to be turbulence. Let me help somebody right here. Your anointing, it attracts trouble. Your assignment, it's the magnet for haters. I sent out one text and I got one message back. I didn't get a hallelujah. I didn't get a thank you, Jesus. I got a what the hell has that got to do with God? I'm going to tell you what the hell it got to do with God. When God begins to move expeditiously in a situation that should have been underwater, somebody say glory. What it got to do with it is, when you find yourself in trouble, you're going to call on the same God that I was celebrating. Your assignment, it draws in the earth disturbers. Watch this. Your assignment will cause people who said they loved you to hate you. And it'll cause your enemies to hook up together. And see, and if you don't respond in ignorance, it will expose to you who your enemies are. Because God showed me my enemies in an instant. I don't believe in have your friends close and your enemies closer. But I do believe in know your friends and know your enemies better. <laughs> I'm almost done. So now that I know you, you ain't no problem to me no more. I want you here every Sunday. I want you on the preaching staff, the choir, the band. I want you dancing, flipping, uh, ushering. I want you to do whatever it is you want to do. Because why are you hating and don't like me? God is still God. And if it's a card in there, I hope you signed it. But then, of course, with all of that, then you still got an enemy. That don't make it easy for you. Come on, you know that scripture. That's my daddy's life scripture. There's an effectual door open unto you, but there's mushrooming opposition. Stuff always coming up. Enemy always trying to keep you from manifesting. And sometimes it ain't even competition. It's just being hateful. Jealousy says, I want what you got. Envy says, because I can't get what you got, I hope you lose it. Envy comes up. So I needed you to be aware that when you're in your God assignment, that it ain't going to be easy. And this ain't going to be when everybody come to your aid. But you got to be balanced, though. Just because folk leave you don't mean you won't assign you. You might be one of the ignorant ones people on assignment getting away from. I thought it. Hey, Chris, uh, don't leave that out. <laughs> but look, look, look. I, I know I got to go. Look at verse 8 through 11 in Acts 27. I told you don't get up yet because you're going to get up in a minute. If you don't get up in a minute, I don't know something wrong with you. Because it made me stand up while I was typing it. I just stood up and typed it. I said, good God. 
It says, watch this. Now remember Paul, I'm back in Acts. Paul, Paul was on this ship, <clears throat> and, and Paul was, was, was working with these guys, and, and they were going from one place to the other, but it was becoming wintertime. The Bible says the fast was over. And that word fast in, in, in there in the Greek, it means the fall was, was ending, the fast of Israel. The fall was coming. And so the Bible says, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast, that's the fall, was now already passed, watch this, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Isn't that just like us? That God gets us to a place of peace. Somebody say fair haven. And we get a word from God. The voice that God has placed in the ship with us. But because we have self-ordained ourselves as master of our own ships, we have become our own evangelists. We have become our own prophets. We have become our own teachers. That when God, while you were in a peaceful place, was trying to use the voice in your life to speak to you, you decided to think for yourself. Wow. We're going to do what we want to do. Somebody shout anyway. We're going to do it our way and on our terms. See, they thought they knew more than Paul. He was just a prisoner in their mind. They were more anointed. They were more gifted. They were more prophetic. They could preach better. They had better discernment. They were more holy. They've been in church longer than him. <laughs> Let me get back to the ship. They, they were more experienced than Paul. So they leaned on their own understanding and what was familiar to them than the storm. Tell somebody the storm coming. He said, don't go. Don't jump out. Don't leave. But they decided they knew better. So the Bible says that some stuff went down. Eurocladin, this storm came up. And so verses 13 through 19 began to describe the storm. And when they were south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close to Creighton. But not long after that arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladin. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we left her dry. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. Which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. That's how you get other people involved with your foolishness. You get people that agree with you about what you don't need and what church can't do for you. And y'all start trying to undergird each other. And, fell, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, and so were driven. And, we're being, and we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out, watch this, with our own hands, the tackling of the ship. Isn't it amazing how when storms come, we're prone to try to deliver our own selves. We do, we're prone to try to depend on our own hands to set us free. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of trying schemes and gimmicks. I'm tired of not seeing God's best in my life. I'm tired of not getting what God says belongs to me. And I'm ready for a turnaround. I'm ready for a breakthrough. I'm ready for a lifting up. I'm ready for something to change. When I get like this, somebody say, I need a word. I need a word. Uh, and the Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and 10 that after that, you suffered for a while. Somebody say after that. 
I heard my bishop say, after that you done been through hell, and after that you done been on the wrong side of the tracks, and after that you have gone through divorce, and after that you have come out of jail, and after that people have dogged you, and after you done messed up your own business, and after folk done walked away from you, and after you done jumped from church to church, and after you done lost your anointing, and after stuff done went down in your life, after a while God's going to bring that thing back. Samson lost his hair he shook and did nothing happen but somebody say his hair grew back after that you've suffered a little while God's going to do something for you and they needed a word so this is why it's good to be in fellowship watch this because even when you can't hear God he's speaking to somebody The Bible says that after many days of no sun and no stars. Did y'all hear that? In other words, it wasn't no quick illumination. It wasn't no revelation while you were off to yourself. There was no sun, but there were no stars. So in other words, you won't get this word from TBN. Your deliverance not going to come from the word network. <laughs> Ain't going to be no stars in this one. It's not going to come from conference to conference. It's not going to come out of a book. This deliverance is going to come from a word that's right there with you in the ship. The Bible says that after a long abstinence, Paul stood up. Isn't it good to know that you can get a word from somebody that, that you're in the storm with? Somebody that didn't run or jump? They might have thought about it, but they heard God. And they begin to encourage you and tell you to stay put and trust God. They proved that they were determined because the same thing that's about to sink you, they act like it ain't even phasing them. Isn't it good to deal with people like you that got money issues, that got health issues, that you can sing next to somebody that got relationship issues, but they ain't going nowhere? that whatever God said is what they believe. Folk has been talked about, left for dead, ridiculed, ostracized, but determined. Somebody that can tell you to keep your head up. Somebody that can say, we coming out of this thing. Amen. Why? Because they got a word. Determination is proven when you can hear God. Somebody who said, my course has been mapped out. My journey has already been navigated. But my destination depends on my determination. Last verse, 23 through 25. I did good, it's 1258. For there stood by me this night. This is Paul speaking to them in the ship. He said, the angel of God. Watch this. Who's... I am and whom I serve. My mom used to always say, you got to know whose you are. Saying, fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Watch this. For I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. It's your determination. It's your willingness to hear the word of the Lord. Believing that what God says is how it's going to be. What did I get while I was in Africa? I got a word from God that told me that I had a word from God. Sometimes it ain't a new word. It's just a word to tell you that you got a word. And when you've got a word from God, it don't matter what goes down, God's word will not change. So what's on my life now? Might not be what you need, but it's a fresh anointing. Hallelujah. Watch this. To finish.
there's a fresh anointing on my life now to finish. heard a guy say there are certain people that played this game and we'll remember a lot of them but the ones we remember the most are the ones that were able to finish some of you the defense on you now is tougher than it's ever been every time you get the ball it's a double team you beat one devil, two more come over to hell. And even every now and then, when you know there's been a foul, there is no whistle. And you just hear somebody just say, play it through. Yes, Lord. Determination is going to get you to your destination. So stuff has been changing your mind. Stuff has been making you wishy-washy. Stuff has been getting you off track. People have been letting you down and things haven't been working out. You've even been distracted by some stuff that didn't seem bad, but you know it got you out of the will of God. If that's you, come hurry up. We ain't got all day. What's on my life now is the ability to finish. But let me tell you something about this anointing. This anointing to finish isn't about crawling into destiny. It isn't about barely making it into destiny. But it's about dealing with what comes against you as if it ain't even coming against you. Paul, Paul didn't tell him, don't panic. Paul said, be of good cheer. So in other words, the louder the storm get, the louder your cheering ought to get. The more the rain comes, the more you ought to shout and give God some praise. Because here's the, here, here's the revelation. This is why you got to have fellowship. When you're in a ship with the right person, because of their destiny, you don't drown. See, so you don't know who's next to you. You don't know what's destined in their life. And you think you've been making it act in the way you act, but it ain't been that way. It's been because you've been in the ship with the right person. Because God wasn't going to let them sink, you're not going to sink. And now you got a chance to get your life together while you're in the boat with somebody with destiny. That's why it's good to be in fellowship. Because see, I might have already jacked up my stuff. But because I'm in the ship with Deborah and God got something determined for Deborah, I'm going to hold on to Deborah. If she don't leave the ship, I ain't leaving the ship. If she don't give up, I ain't going to give up. And after a while, my anointing will come back. And after a while, that sin will fall off. And after a while, I'll get my fortitude back. And after a while, my praise will increase. And after a while, I'll be encouraged to do what God called me to do. Yeah. Need to hear a word. How many can be honest? Your ears have been clawed. You ain't love God no less, but you ain't hearing God like you used to hear God. Confused. You got more questions now than you did before you got saved. That's the enemy. But I believe. Everybody touch somebody. I believe. Some transference comes by the laying on the hands. And some comes by prophecy, I found out. So I'm going to prophesy that you're going to have the anointing to finish. And when you're rocking in and the storms come against you, you're not going to deny that there's a storm. But it's not going to affect your determination. It's not going to affect what God said about you. You're going to become addicted to your destiny. And that you'll let everything fall away to hold on to what God has said about you. It's been hell. You've messed up. 
They've messed you up. They've come against you. They've conspired against you. The enemy has raised up his ranks on you. But God hasn't changed his mind about you. You've been ordained and decreed from the foundation of the world. And there's an anointing to finish. But you can't leave the ship. Wherever you've been assigned, you can't leave the ship. And you can't treat the ship like it's any other ship. Paul is on your ship. The word of God is on your ship. Even if you're a visitor here today and there's somewhere else you're supposed to be, get back in your ship. Father, I thank you and I bless you for your anointing. I bless you for your shift, God. I bless you that when I thought I was going just to serve and to be around the man of God, that it was actually somebody else that said shift. It was actually something that somebody else said that caused me to become addicted to my destiny. But God, because I rode that ship with my man of God, I got where I was supposed to be. I thank you for humility. I thank you for submission. I thank you for obedience. I thank you for detaching me from something that I thought I was eternally attached to. Stuff and things and material items. I thank you, God, that this anointing isn't for me. But it's for everybody that's been suffering for a while. That's lost a step in their dance. That's trying to praise, but it's only on the outside. That God, you stir up something fresh and something new. That there be an anointing to finish, God. That we can be trampled upon. That storms can come, but we ain't moving from your kingdom agenda. That God, like never before, will serve you. Will honor you. Will worship you. Not only in the sanctuary, but with our lives and our lifestyles. God, that people that know us will begin to see something different. They'll know something different. They'll hear something different. We won't speak with perverse lips. God, we won't talk about those things that are contrary to the word of God. That we won't allow ourselves, God, in the name of Jesus, to say about ourselves what's opposite of what you've already spoken. So, God, there's a fresh power. There's a fresh release. A fresh anointing in this place. It's not a feeling, but it's a determination. It's not something that's going to give us goosebumps. It's something that's going to make us courageous and humble, but strong. Every situation that's come against us, we applaud you in it in advance. We celebrate your goodness. We thank you for your ability to turn it around. Give us peace. Give us poise. Give us patience. But after we've suffered a while, you'll restore us. You'll replenish us. And you'll settle our debt. And you'll settle us into what you've called us to do. For every woman of God in this place, used, abused, left. God, we pray now that you would just restore them with love and integrity and virtue. Women who have abused themselves to get by, to get over, to get through. God, that you would cover them now with a garment of value. A garment of worth. God, I pray for every man in this place. God, where we've misaligned our manhood and used it in the wrong way and tried to prove it with our loins instead of our spirit. 
God, where we've been weak and afraid to say something, where we've needed help and afraid to ask, and where we've been broken but where our pride wouldn't allow us to call out on your name. Let our manhood show forth in our worship and how we lead others. God, for every family in this place, strengthen God. Unite like never before. Touch them. Help them. For every parent, give them wisdom and discernment about their children. For every child, give them reverence and honor for their parents. For every leader in this house, God, I pray that you would give us a fresh anointing for every minister in this place that we would hear from God a clarion word something that would represent heaven in the midst of our hell God that when people would leave this sanctuary they will know that they've been in your presence that they'll recognize that they heard the voice of God speaking through every man or woman that will don this pulpit for every leader God I just pray that we would be humble and serve you as we serve the people. That we would not use position to position ourselves. But that you would posture us as servants. And for every member, every part of this family. God, that there be a fresh unity. God, that you would expose those that are rebellious and cynical. But God, that you'd begin to bless us as we try to unify and work with one another and love one another and forgive one another and help one another and aid and abet one another in destiny and purpose and God that you would teach us that every part of our lives belongs to you we haven't obtained anything nor do we have anything that's not yours and God we'd be willing to give it all to you our heart our soul our mind knowing that you are a great comforter you are the merciful God and it's because of your goodness in the midst of our mess that we ought to repent. Bless us, God. Teach us to walk holy. Teach us to be righteous. Teach us to be upright. That we might serve you and represent you well. Now, God, there's a spirit on these people now to finish whatever it is you started. To not fall back to not be lazy, to not be apathetic, to not get frustrated, to not get turned around, to not be allured, to not be disillusioned, to not be tricked by the enemy, by a friend, by a husband, by a wife, by somebody that's close to them that tells them to turn away from you. Encourage us now that nothing shall be lost but that we believe what you've spoken. It will be even as you said. Thank you for destiny. Thank you for determination. Shall these bones live? Can this potential manifest? So I speak to some bones that's been in a valley. Stretch your hands to God. If you've been in a valley, stretch your hands to God. I speak to these bones that's been in a valley. Bones that's been dry, and the Bible says very dry. You've been going to work, you've been being a parent, you've been being a wife, you've been being a husband, you've even been in church, you've been tithing, but you've been dry. I prophesy, hear ye the word of the Lord. And the Bible says that he'll breathe on you. He'll connect you. And eventually he'll make you stand up an exceeding great army. So God, I thank you that their ears have been opened. Their hearts have been opened. Prophetically to hear the word of the Lord. Not only from the south side of the sanctuary, 
but in the midnight hour, in their alone time. No sun, no stars, but there will be a word in the midst of their storm. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now give God the best praise you've ever given him. Come on, bless him the best you've ever blessed him. Think about your situation and then think about God bringing you to freedom and bless his name. I believe God has set somebody free today. Have somebody say there is a word. There is a word. I believe before the week is out, case is gonna be overturned. I prophesy somebody that got denied, you're gonna get a call back this week. Somebody that told you no is gonna have to call you back this week. They changed their mind. I believe that in my heart. I truly believe what God showed me this morning is somebody's going to the doctor this week and what they said is not going to be there. But I want you to know, I want you to know that it's not because they made a mistake, but it's because God healed you this morning. It ain't going to be because they made a mistake. They saw what they saw. It was what it was. But God, somebody say, but God, I believe that today. I believe that today. I believe somebody's going to get some good news this week and it's going to change your life. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. And, I don't, and I'm not saying it just kind of generically. I'm saying somebody's going to get some serious good news this week and it's going to change your life. How many people here need some good news? You need, you need a miracle. So God, see the people that need the news. You've already determined who's going to get it, but God, we're, we're waving our hands to you. We're giving you a heave offering, and we're, we're saying, I know the song says that while you're blessing others, please don't pass us by. But God, I, I just believe that God, you're no respecter of persons, and that your eyes go to and fro, waiting to see whose heart is perfect towards you, that you might show yourself mighty. God's looking for some people that believe him like never before. And so I'm thankful. Is there anybody in this place that needs to come back to God or get saved for the first time? I would have left, but I felt like I needed to say it. Don't you be ashamed. If either you know you need to get back to God, I'm just being totally 100%. You walked away. You had got out of the things of God but you want to get back to God, you refuse to stay out of the will of God. Come on, come on, there's some more people. Come on, come on, come on. God's changing your life right now. God's doing something, he's doing something great for you right now. It's happening right now. Come on, come on, don't you be ashamed. Don't worry about what they gonna think. I need to get back to God. I need to be in the face of God. I ain't done a whole lot wrong, but I need God to speak to me. Seven is the number of completion. Father, we thank you. We honor you for these, your people who have come back to you. For whatever reason, God, slid back, fell back, walked back. Just allowed their minds to get off track. Allowed themselves to be distracted, even if it was something that seemed good. We're not supposing that it was sin, God, but just wanting to be on the trek with you. So, God, we thank you for their boldness. We thank you for their courage. We thank you. You've already given them the ability to finish. But now, God, this ability to maintain in the midst, this ability to trust you when all else is failing, this ability to overcome their next temptation this ability to deal with what they haven't dealt with well yet but God now there's an anointing to deal with it the right way God's way and we honor you so just in the midst of completion 
you added one. So now we declare, God, that there's a new beginning. And so now I declare that for every person in this room, that there'll be a new beginning, a right beginning again with you. So, Father, we thank you. We love you. Anybody coming for the first time to get saved? Everybody just coming back to God. You coming for the first time to get saved? Praise him, praise him, praise him. Come on, you ought to rejoice. Don't you let no angel how rejoice you. Best decision you ever made in your life, man. Best decision you ever made in your life. And God, God really made it easy for us when he died on the cross. He just simply said that if we would just confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that when he died for us, that God raised him from the dead so that you can have eternal life. And not just eternal life, but life abundantly right now. That what God has determined about you when you were an embryo, when you were just being conceived in your mother's womb, whatever God determined about you, God wants it to manifest. So everything that you've been through, all things work together for good. Everything's going to have a way of working itself out. It's going to be for a reason. You wonder why you went through that? In a minute, you're going to say, oh, that's what that was for. He saved you for your soul. But he's going to leave you in the earth for somebody else's. But now that he saved you, he wants to bring you up, mature you, nurture you. So now you can be a blessing to somebody else. So that your testimony will reign supreme in somebody's heart. So, Father, we thank you for this man of God. We thank you for his life. We thank you for what you're going to do with him. We thank you for the journey. But, God, most of all, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. That if he would just confess that you are Lord and believe in his heart, you raised, him, raised Jesus from the dead. Then, God, you have received yet another one of your creation, now adopted again as your child. We love you, sir. We honor you. We thank you for what you do. Our efforts are nothing without your spirit. And we bless you. Now, God, fill him with your Holy Spirit. Seal his salvation. Speak to him in the womb of his spirit. That, God, as he hears about the Holy Ghost and this comforter and this trainer and this power, that he might be filled with it, baptized in it, and even speak with new tongues and speak with a fresh boldness. Save him for real, God. God, we're tired of all this flimsy salvation in the earth where people are coming to the altar because they just want you to do something but they don't desire to be something. But God, place a desire and a passion in him to be the church and not just come to church. And so God, we thank you and we honor you. Change his heart, change his life that he might be a blessing to somebody else. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together service is over. I want you to go with this lady right there, okay? I want you to follow her. Amen. Come on, get your seeds in your hand. Get your gifts in your hand. Come on, now you already came back to God. Now we got to do Bible study. We got to get back to doing what God wants us to do. We can't come to God in a, in a service and not press in. The fact that you were bold, God's got something great for you. Come on, get that seed ready in your hand.